Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This has been a very long week. I think they're all getting long. I know they're only seven days, but they always seem like they're eight or longer. And uh, this week was a long one. I had a funeral on Friday for a dear friend, um, my mother's best friend, in fact. Uh, last week, while I was preaching at Arise in Christ, she went to pick her up for church and found that she had gone to be with Jesus just as she was brushing her teeth for church. I guess that's the way I want to go to. I want to be brushing my teeth for church when Jesus comes to find me. Uh, that's a good place to be. But at any rate, uh, it, it was a very exhausting week and an intense week for my mother. And since my mother lives alone and she's 87 and, you know, she doesn't have a lot of friends left, it's, it's a difficult time. So I, I'd appreciate if you keep her in your prayers this week and next as she tries to adjust to life without her best friend, who literally lived across the yard, the backyard stuff. They would literally talk across the fence every day. There are... <clears throat> There are some things that go on in this world, some experiences in life where the most appropriate response is silence. I think of those crisp fall nights in October when you get home and you look up and you see the vast dim river of the Milky Way. Orion's Belt and the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia. If you were a Boy Scout and got your astronomy merit badge, you would, you would see those things. Some of those nights you can even see Venus and Mars and Jupiter, depends upon how early or how late or how much ambient light there is. But you know what? Knowing the silence, knowing the astronomy, that does not enhance or detract from the moment at all. Such beauty does not beget curiosity. It begets silence. And Psalm 46 comes to mind. Be still and know that I am God. That's what you feel like. Well, something like that happened to three of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James, and John, one day on a mountaintop in Galilee. It was a moment that left them at first speechless, a moment of mystery, if you were, that they could not explain. Mountains have always been places of mystery in the Bible. These are places where God and man encounter one another. It was on top of Mount Sinai that God first met Moses. We read the story today about how after they had returned from the Exodus, God meets him there again and his face shines. That encounter with God changes him. He has to cover his face with a veil so he doesn't scare the neighbors when he goes down to talk about the law. On Mount of Beatitudes, we read here a couple weeks ago where Jesus talked about what life in the kingdom was like. Blessed, 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 he said. It was on a mountaintop in Galilee where he meets his disciples after the resurrection to commission them to go into the world to teach and preach and baptize. It was on a mountaintop outside of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, where he's ascended into heaven. Mountains are significant places in the Old and the New Testament, places of epiphany and mystery. So it's no surprise that today Jesus takes three disciples up a mountain. We don't know where it was. It's an unnamed mountain. He takes them up there to encounter God, and there his face has changed. He's transfigured. He shines. And the disciples finally get over their fright and try to speak of what they had seen. What they remembered is that his face was shining, just like Moses's, And that Moses and Elijah were there talking to him, having this conversation. And when it's all over, when the midst of this remarkable moment, finally it's Peter who finds his voice and says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Thanks for asking us. It was great. We should build three booths, chapels, tents, structures, whatever you translate that word, skune in the Greek, right here, right now, to commemorate the event. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, because that's what we do, you know. We put up brick monuments, you know. Here lies Joe Schmo. You can't go into a city without seeing a brick monument that commemorates this or that person or event. That's what we do. And just as he's having that conversation with himself, mostly this great cloud roils forth and a voice comes out and says this is my son the one whom I love why don't you listen to him because there are some experiences in life where the most appropriate response is silence but we live in the noisy boisterous 21st century and we don't much like silence we fill every waking moment with sound my grandkids seem to have electronic earbuds permanently implanted in their ears. Of course, I have, I have one of these left. I lost one at the graveyard on, on Friday, just so you know that nothing's changed in my life. <laughs> we have to have sound all the time. And to be honest, 
we not only don't like silence, we don't like mystery. We want things explained to us. We want it laid out for us. Western thinking has depended upon reason to discern truth. Truth, such as it is these days, is something you can observe and analyze and weigh and measure and explain and anything that can't be weighed and measured and analyzed, it just can't be true. And that's why I think Peter wanted to build those three chapels in the face of mystery. Why silence was and remains such an unsatisfying response. Because like Peter, it is in our DNA to want to say something, to want to tame the transcendent, to control it, to make it domesticated like a dog. Rather than engage the Holy One of Israel, we seek or to settle for the God of good ideas or noble aspirations. Rather than wrestle with the angel by the side of the river Jabbok, we'd rather worship the God of fear and paranoia. And so in this, the 21st century, we will not stand silent before mystery. Oh no, we want to argue with it and disagree with it with louder and angrier and more insistent voices. He who is left standing is the one who wins the fight. We don't seek truth, we seek to tame the truth. And as a result, the idolatrous God we end up worshiping is not the Holy One of Israel, it is the God of triviality and simplicity and comfort, the God we can fit inside our bubble, the one we can control and tame, like a dog. We even have a special language to talk about that, God. We don't, we don't pray to the Holy One of Israel. We don't pray to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, we pray to the big guy, the man upstairs. See how trivialized we have made it? He's the old guy that lives above the grocery store now. We pray fervently and with intensity to a God who will help us find a parking space in a busy day or will help our team beat the other team. And by the way, God is not a Browns fan. <laughs> or the one who will support our narrow and angry politics using the language of religion. We have created a God in our own image, a simplistic, shallow, vacuous God who bears no resemblance to the Holy One of Israel, a God with no power to intervene, and in this world, no power to save it. Now, I'm a pastor, of course, and talk is my trade. <laughs> you. Uh, you would not so much appreciate 15 minutes of silence instead of a sermon. Well, maybe. Maybe getting out 15 minutes earlier would be a nice preference for you. Don't hold your breath, by the way. They didn't happen. We are creatures of language. We need to talk. I mean, how can you shout amen or complain about my bias or naivete if I don't say anything? Nevertheless, there are some experiences in life where the most appropriate response is silence. And so today, we are reminded that even for we creatures of talk, the heart of the Holy One of Israel is mystery. And the mystery is hard to explain and hard to share. We are no better at taming the transcendent than Peter was. But the Bible makes the rather bold claim that God is holy and God is other. When confronted by such a God, people tend to get overwhelmed and stunned by his divine presence, and the church tends to forget this attribute of God. Too often, the church wants to speak boldly and with confidence about what is God's will or what is God's clear position on this or that complex social issue or God's political preferences. This is just noise. And it's not only breathtakingly shallow, it's theologically bankrupt. It is certainly not scriptural. For who can know the mind of God? Who can discern his thoughts? That's what St. Paul wrote. You can argue with him if you want. In this past decade especially, I've had so many painful conversations with people struggling about whether or not they can stay in the church. People on both sides of the political spectrum. If you're a conservative, you, the church is too liberal. And if you're liberal, the church is too conservative. And I'm tired of it. I'm retiring in four months so I can join you and complain about the pastor's sermons. <laughs> people are confused and angry about a God that comes across as cocksure or utterly irrelevant. They don't understand why the church is so quick to condemn and so slow to forgive. It would be so refreshing to me as one of these, one of these big time televangelists when asked about a complex social issue would just be honest and say, I don't know, I don't know. I only know that God is merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love because that's what the Bible teaches. And how unsatisfying is that? <laughs> 
So Luke tells the story about this day when the disciples go up a mountain with Jesus to stand in awe before the mystery of the Holy One of Israel. But this story does not end on the top of a mountain. It has two scenes. The first is a mountaintop encounter where Jesus shines. The second one takes place at the bottom of that mountain where Jesus heals. Christian tradition calls Luke the physician, but you know he was also a pastor and writing to a church of his time. Unlike the other gospel writers, he actually came from and wrote to a congregation. His story was deeply attentive to the worship life of that church from its very beginning. Luke's story invites the reader into a deep engagement with the Holy One of Israel, the transcendent God of the mountain, but that engagement was meant to challenge and to change their lives, especially at the bottom of the hill where they lived. He wrote to people who, like the shepherds in the fields or the disciples on the mountaintop, were desperately hungering to understand what it meant to follow Jesus. Today, in the exact middle of his gospel, and I mean the exact middle, Luke tells the story of Jesus going up the mountain on the eighth day. The other gospel writers say it was four days or six days, the eighth day. Why? Because in Luke's church, that's what they called this day, Sunday, the eighth day. The first day of the week, the first day after the, the, the resurrection, the first day of the journey that every Christian who followed Jesus had to make, the eighth day. It's why I think the second half of this story is so important, maybe even more important than the first half, because the church sometimes wants to retreat from the world in its worship. It gathers to listen and be immersed in the story of Jesus and to pray, but that retreat has got to be followed by an advance into the world to heal the sick and to speak words of hope and liberation and to stand against evil. Worship has never been designed as a retreat from the world. It's the way we disciples are equipped to go out and change the world, to descend the mountain, to go into the valley of need. Now, I want to stop here and just ask you a question. Why are you here today? Now, I know some of you came to, to watch the First Communion. That's, that's cool. Glad for that. Miss seeing you. And it's rare enough for anybody to gather on a Sunday these days, in case you hadn't noticed. Fewer and fewer of us are doing that. So it's not that I'm not happy to see you, because I am. But I want to ask you why you're here. Is it out of a sense of duty? Is it out of a habit? Did you come to hear a great, uh, a great musical number from the choir? Because it is great. They're wonderful. Did you come to hear a clever sermon? Well, I'm doing my best. <laughs> Did you come here to get away from the hectic life in the 21st century? It's all well and good. But I ask you this. Might your encounter with the Holy One of Israel in this place enable you to catch a vision of what the church might be if it actually was the body of Christ in the world? Because that's the question that hangs over us every week. What does it mean to be the body of Christ in the world? That worship is a place to meet the Holy One of Israel, to hear his voice, to be fed at his table. It's also the place from which we are sent to live lives of meaning and purpose. This is the challenge we face. We are God's beloved children. Here, God in Christ is revealed to us through word and sacrament. Here, God commissions and equips us to make a difference out there. Now imagine what might happen if we heard that message, caught that vision, and were changed by it. Because instead of allowing those disciples to build three booths, Jesus comes down the mountain and calls them to follow him into the valley. After the mystical cloud and the holy encounter, they follow him down the mountain to find what? A frantic father and a sick child. Because that's what life is like out there, by the way. Frantic parents and sick children. We pastors, of course, you know, we're, we're creatures of talk. And creatures of talk are uncomfortable with things they can't understand or explain. We seek also to reject and control things we can't possess. We seek to tame the transcendent and stay up on the mountaintop. That's why, by the way, I have such a deep regard for Pastor Peter Cruz. Same thing. What do you see in that guy? <laughs> Let me tell you. This is a guy that understands what it's like to stand in the presence of the Holy One of Israel. To incorporate that presence. To let that presence change him. So that he can go out and be the person that Christ has called him to be in the world. That ain't me. I'm the least spiritual guy you ever meet. You see, when uh, Pastor Jim is talking about getting get your ashes in church, 
Now you don't complain about me saying crap in sermons anymore, got it? <laughs> because that's who I am, see? But that's also not who I'm called to be. We need to embrace the mystery because the mystery exists for a reason, for a purpose. It points beyond itself to what comes after. Mystery leads us down the mountain into the valley of need. And this journey is a metaphor for what the church, the body of Christ, is meant to be a sacrament to the world. For what the church does to welcome and accept and love and serve in the name of Jesus Christ. There are mountains and moments where the church brings us into the presence of the Holy One of Israel to remind us that we owe our lives to that mystery. And there are moments when the church points to and embraces the mystery, but they don't exist in a vacuum. They exist not for their own sake. They point to when the church in the name of Christ goes down the mountain into the valley of need where children are sick and parents are weeping because mystery and healing and worship and service walk hand in hand. They're not disconnected activities. So if you walk out of here and you think the worship is done, you've missed the point. Because worship is designed to send you out to do and to be the body of Christ in the world. And we witness this here every week. We'll see it today as our young people take communion for the first time. They come forward to be fed and empowered and then sent into the world to witness and serve. And if you're not teaching them that, you're missing your job. We give them the food. You teach them how to take that food and translate it into the work that Christ has called them to do. Every week, we encounter the Holy One in Israel at the Sunset Cafe, sharing a meal with the lonely and the poor every week as the quiet intimacy of prayerful Sunday morning worship gives way to the noisy chaos of Cub Scouts running through this building. It is the Holy One of Israel who walks through these hallways. The lyrical music of our chancel choir that lends context to the creaking tables and the folding chairs of the dozens of GED and ESOL students who come here to learn and to grow and to belong, to be different, because they have a dream and a vision. And we're here to show it and help it. The Holy One of Israel is revealed in their gathering. The elegant silence of the Lord's Supper gives voice to the man who comes to the office on a Wednesday afternoon looking for help because he's tormented and broken and has nowhere else to go. So he goes to the place that Jesus made for him to find hope and healing and purpose. It's the Holy One of Israel we meet and the Holy One of Israel we follow. It's the Holy One of Israel we glorify when we go into the valley of need to serve and to preach and to heal in his name. Jim Wallace, the editor of Sojourners Magazine, just recently retired, once wrote, in Jesus, God hits the streets. Well, amen to that. He first, though, comes down the mountain. And that's the story today. The Holy One of Israel, revealed in cloud and mystery on top of the mountain, comes down, incarnated, into the valley of need. The journey for his disciples and for his church, that's where it begins. And this Wednesday, we begin the journey again with Lent. We join our Lord on his own journey to Jerusalem and to the cross, that final mystery, a journey that begins in our baptism. For in spite of the transfigured mystery on the mountain, nothing is more mysterious than the mystery of a Messiah who suffers and dies for all of our sakes on a cross. That's the ministry we ponder at the cusp of Lent. The mystery of a man named Jesus, his teaching, his healing, and his loving journey to the cross for your sake and mine. We can't explain it, and we can't tame it. We can only stand in awe before it and listen to the one who calls us to follow, to follow him down the mountain and into the valley of need. To God be the glory. Amen.